So uh, actually it's an easy class, which is designed to empower every student to explore the possibilities of using bioinformatics as a tool to understand botany and indeed life sciences. So the part of the class that I will cover with you has actually been running in uh, various avatars uh, with every batch of MSc students since 2003. Uh, as uh, was just mentioned, I joined the university in 2003 and we ran the first bioinformatics based assignment uh, at the department here. This was particularly useful and fun because students could access the most recent updated sequence data and also use robust tools to explore concepts in plant cell biology. Um, before I begin, uh, I must give credit to a few people who inspired the evolution of these bioinformatic approaches uh, way back in 2003. So I must thank Professor Ron Elba from the Department of Computer Sciences at Cornell University, Professor Alex Potham at Old Dominion University, who is now at Purdue, who taught bioinformatics to electrical and computer engineering students like Dr. Saurav Mazumdar, uh, who shared their assignments and the excitement of doing these uh, uh, assignments with me. So I'm sharing and passing on the, the tradition, if you like. So these approaches that uh, existed in 2003 in the US that I'm talking about involved sequence alignments, phylogenetic trees, and motif uh, predictions using softwares like Clustol, Hummer, RASMOL, and so on and so forth. So these have sort of evolved over time, uh, and they have actually become more accessible to students in botany. And it depends upon the... Uh, the focus with which you address uh, these topics. So I hope that you will find the class useful. And uh, without much further ado, I'm going to try and share my screen. Otherwise, I will ask Mansi to help me. OK, so here we are. OK, can you guys see this? All right. Yeah. Thank you. OK. So uh, thank you again. Uh, I've called this class Plant Cell Biology 101 Meets Bioinformatics. So uh, today we are going to cover uh, certain uh, topics uh, over the next two hours. Uh, and uh, the students who will be helping me are shown here on the list. I also wanted to tell you that the entire PDF of what we are going to talk about is actually available as a PDF at this website. We will also be sending the PDF to uh, Professor uh, Kamra, uh, Rajni Ma'am, as well as uh, Renu Ma'am, uh, and they can use that also in the future. So uh, I'm actually going to talk about uh, bioinformatics and actins in Arabidopsis. So uh, this slide is sort of an overview uh, which tells us that computational biology or bioinformatics enables us to look at different uh, sequence data available in a cell. And this cell is very interdisciplinary. Uh, it can be animal, plant, bacterial, positive or negative, stranded, viral, uh, viruses. Uh, these genomes can be nuclear, mitochondrial, or chloroplast. And uh, these uh, sequence data uh, is uh, available to the public domain uh, or otherwise because of various recombinant DNA technologies such as cloning, PCR, that students may learn about in their classes, as well as DNA sequencing. So these DNA se sequencing technologies have evolved over time. Uh, in addition to Sanger sequencing, there are also various uh, next generation sequencing platforms based on Illumina, PacBio, and so on and so forth that uh, provide the sequence data that is uh, available for various genomes from different cells. So since this is a Herculean task of uh, maintaining this large amount of data, they are actually organized as genome sequencing projects. So the first one of such uh, projects which has gone into the annals of history is uh, Hugo, the human genome uh, uh, project from 1996, released in 1996, 
And of course, the classical Arabidopsis information resource or TER. Uh, so the sequence databases, the, the banks uh, of sequences that allow us to retrieve the information from various genome sequencing projects, which of course are now very large in number, uh, are uh, such as NCBI um, uh, and uh, the protein database of PDB. So for our class, uh, uh, for Plant Cell Bio 101, uh, we are actually interested in computational biology or bioinformatics that lets us use, retrieve, and use the information that is available from these various genome sequencing projects in the sequence databases and use that to design our own questions, ask our own research questions, uh, get some answer and try and understand concepts. So that's what all this class is about. Okay, so uh, this slide gives you a little bit of a history. So the first woman uh, or the first person who organized the sequences of uh, various gene families was actually Margaret Dayhoff, a woman in the 1970s. Uh, another person who was involved in the uh, establishment of the sequence databases has been attributed to Walter Goad from the Los Alamos National Lab uh, in New Mexico. And uh, some of the very common uh, sequence databases that you may have heard of or not are DDBJ, the DNA database of Japan, EMBL, the European Molecular Biology Lab, NCBI, uh, which are all nucleic acid and plus databases. So for proteins, it is uh, much more uh, useful to use PIR from UK, Swiss Pro, uh, MIPS, which is from Germany, JIPID, which is from Japan. So for class, uh, over these years, uh, what we use is uh, NCBI, Dot nlm dot nih dot gov, uh, which is from the United States. Okay, so I like this slide. Uh, this slide uh, has a list of some of the books that I think are great. And for all the young students out there who may want to sort of get into the particular field and explore, uh, these are some very good books. So I will start with Higgins and Taylor. Uh, which is a book that is available from the Oxford University Press. Uh, there is an Indian edition available about it. I'll talk about it in the last slide again. Another book which is really great from where most of my slides uh, as an introduction are based is Bioinformatics by David Mount. Another excellent book uh, is by Jonathan Pevsina. Uh, and these are all three books. The first one is a very thin book, but my favorite, my absolute favorite, uh, which inspires me, uh, is a book called Inferring Phylogenies by Joseph Felsenstein. Uh, and this book, uh, Joseph Felsenstein, is known uh, for maximum likelihood approaches to making phylogenetic trees. Uh, this is a beautiful book. Uh, and uh, I think these books are all available, if I'm not much mistaken, I think these books are all available at the Central Science Library. They are available at the Department of Botany Library, which is across the street. So if you get a chance, you can have a look. And if there is time when you guys can all visit uh, and you can't find the book, you're welcome to come and sit in a corner in our lab and also read them if you want. So uh, the book by Felsenstein, again, is a really good book. Uh, and it talks about maximum likelihood principles. Uh, there's a very good follow-up to it uh, in a book by David Posada. Uh, which is also inspired by Felsenstein's book about maximum likelihood. So uh, these are some of the books that uh, students might like to have a look at. So uh, for our class today, uh, we're going to talk about how uh, the computational biology tools that we will talk about lets you use databases to look at genes, which encode proteins. You know that proteins have structure, have a particular three-dimensional structure. And if the structure is correct, then there is a particular function that might be performed. And as you know, behind every function, there is a polypeptide or a gene that uh, carries out that particular function. So this is a loop that can be studied in greater detail using these sequence databases. So if you like this loop, you might like this loop as well. So in this particular loop, what you are seeing is a gene family. 
Okay, so gene family, like most other families, include uh, sequences which are related by common evolutionary descent and they look like each other. Okay, so uh, you can look at members of a gene family, which we will talk about in a bit. Um, and the proteins that are encoded by these gene families would be homologous proteins. Now, if you're looking at a set of homologous proteins, you're probably looking at structures, three-dimensional structures that are conserved. So if you're looking at proteins with conserved structure, you're probably looking at related functions. And then if you're looking at proteins with related functions, you may be looking at members of a gene family. So the sequence databases enables you to look at this particular loop again. So for class today, we will be using the example of molecular evolution of actin genes in Arabidopsis thaliana. As you know, actins are, I think you've done this in school as well. So actins are, uh, you know, major components of the cytoskeleton. And uh, this particular example highlights how bioinformatics can be used to study in gene products, which participate in functional organization of cells. Okay, so uh, Arabidopsis thaliana and actin genes are actually organized as a gene family. There are uh, 10 genes, eight of which are functional and two are pseudogenes. I don't know if there are any students out there at this point of time. If we were interacting physically, I would have asked you what is a pseudogene? Does anybody want to tell me what is a pseudogene? Can you tell Shubham? Ma'am is asking pseudogenes. We have talked in the last semester. Or is ma'am is ma'am torturing you? Uh, I, I mean, am I out torturing you? So I will not ask questions. But uh, no, you should. I think they should uh, answer back. Yes, yes, yes. Young people, anybody out there? I am looking at the name. We all are there from the uh, yes. fifth semester. Because yes, in don't. third semester, I have talked about this pseudogene and all. Yes, but hardly please don't I be know. shy. Don't be shy. Uh, you can tell me. I will ask you later on. Maybe we can chat at the end of the end of our uh, time. Hi, Akshi. Go ahead. Dixon, can you tell me the, what is pseudogene? What are Yakshi, pseudogene? you'll have to unmute yourself. Ma'am, it's a mutated form of a gene which acts like a gene, but it's not a gene properly. What do you mean? What do you mean not mm. properly? Ma'am, it means that it's a mutated form of a gene which is not original, or it may be a false gene. Uh, that's a literal transliteration. So do you think it is translated? Is an mRNA form? Is it translated? Is it functional? Okay, you're partially correct. Uh, we will go back to that. Uh, so the Arabidopsis actin gene, Yakshi uh, and dear students, uh, has 10 genes in the gene family, out of which eight are functional and two are pseudogenes. Okay, so if you want to study the actin gene family in Arabidopsis and you want to understand and learn more about it, you can go to NCBI uh, as shown on the slide here, on, on the screen here. And uh, you can type in the words Arabidopsis, actin, and hit search. Okay, for the purposes of class today, we will only be talking about protein sequences. You can also do the same with nucleotides, but to keep things straightforward, let's uh, talk about proteins. Okay, so uh, NCBI, like uh, you know, your Yahoo and Google are ontological databases, which means that uh, they depend on the search words, the search words that you use. So if you go to NCBI and you type the words Arabidopsis and actin as shown in the in the search. Uh, bar right on the top, you will find all the hits showing up where the word actin comes. 
So in cytoskeletons, uh, genes that encode cytoskeletal proteins, you have uh, actins, you have tubulins, uh, you have intermediate filaments in the case of uh, uh, animals. Uh, you also have accessory proteins, which are associated with actins. So all of that, like actin depolymerizing factor, here it shows actin binding protein, they will all show up in the ontological database. But you can go through that, or you know that there are various actin genes in Adapidopsis, which are called ACT1, ACT2, ACT3. And as you can see in the screen here, ACT12. So if you click on ACT12, you will see what is known as an annotation page. So this is a screenshot of what an annotation page looks like. Annotation page is what the raw data, if you like, of uh, uh, NCBI is. So on the left side, you see what are known as definitors, which give you a, a common definition that is of interest, like a locus, which is a unique number for a particular sequence. And it tells you what the organism is, what its taxonomy currently is. It also gives you the name of authors who have published about that particular sequence for the first time. So this is a um, annotation page from 1996, a long time ago, where uh, Bob Meager's group uh, talked about the Arabidopsis actin gene family for the first time. But for our point of view and for most bioinformatic applications of looking at the world, uh, the most important part of it is the actual sequence information, which is usually available at the bottom, where you can see there is a string of amino acids, okay? a string of amino acids which constitute the actual sequence of this particular actin gene, ACT3 gene in Arabidopsis. So when you can find these uh, sequences in the database, which comprise the actin gene family in Arabidopsis, you make what is known as a FASTA file, okay? So in a FASTA file, you put the uh, information in a particular format that is easily accessible to the softwares that you will use downstream. So there are some rules of making a faster file. You have to put the caret, you know, the greater than sign at the beginning and give a particular name to the sequence that you want to look at. So this is a faster file of all the functional actin genes of Arabidopsis. So act one, act two, act three, act four, so on and so forth. And in this particular exercise, we want to understand what is the relationship. Why are there so many genes in the actin gene family? Okay, uh, do they perform the same function? In which case, why do you need so many of them? Okay, and if they perform different functions, why do they perform different functions? What is it about their sequence, about their protein sequence? What about their uh, structure maybe that makes them perform different functions? What is the relation between these sequences, how have they evolved, okay? Which is very cool for all biologists to look at. So if you look at the FASTA file itself, you'll see that uh, they are similar. So ACT1 has MAD, GED, blah, blah, blah. You have ACT2, which has MAE, ADD. So the D, the third position is replaced by a E and G is replaced by a A, okay? So you can see from the FASTA file outright that ACT1 and ACT3, are probably more similar to each other than ACT2. So since this is a last large, uh, uh, large FASTA file with uh, multiple entries, okay, you need computational tools to look at it carefully. So you now have a FASTA file, which is made up of all the sequences of functional actin genes uh, in Arabidopsis. So you have a FASTA file and you want to understand uh, you know, how they are related. So you need to do what is called a multiple sequence alignment. So obviously your FASTA file has to have members of the same gene family. And in order to do a multiple sequence alignment, you can look at the FASTA file just manually and see if there is strong sequence similarity. So there are three major philosophies, if you like, of doing multiple sequence alignment. These are maximum parsimony, distance methods and maximum likelihood methods. So maximum likelihood is what I talked to you about, about Joseph Felsenstein's book, 
Uh, and uh, there is another approach, which we shall talk about in the second part of our class today, uh, which is what my students will talk about, which is the Bayesian uh, probability-based uh, methods. So in these particular methods, that is maximum parsimony or MP, distance and maximum likelihood or ML, okay, it depends upon the amount of similarity of the sequences which are there in your first of all. So if the sequences are very similar, you use maximum parsimony, a very stringent method to uh, look at uh, members of a gene family, or a distance method, which is kind of in, the, in between maximum likelihood and maximum parsimony. And maximum likelihood method, which to put very, very simply, okay, is a way of looking at sequences which are not so similar to each other but they have conserved domains and they belong to the same gene family. Okay, so for our class, we use something that is easy, sort of in the middle of the stream, that is the distance-based method. So you have your FASTA file and you want to create a multiple sequence alignment, which is a way of looking at how sequences are related to each other. So in order to do that, you can go to many softwares, but uh, the most common one is Clustol W. So uh, Clustol W, uh, the author of Clustol W is actually uh, one of the people whose books we were talking about earlier. So there are many versions of Clustol W, including Clustol Omega, but uh, you can go to a different site, like it's shown on the screen here, www.ebi.ac.uk. You can use other softwares like Mega, which are all freewares, and you can get a multiple sequence event. So there are, if you go to this particular page, this is what the page looks like. And you can just use the various default parameters, okay, until you come to the GUI page, okay? So the GUI is very useful and it helps, uh, you know, people who do not do coding to actually use various softwares, bioinformatic tools. So you can copy and paste your FASTA file here and you can hit run. So once you hit run, as I tell my students, you can go have a cup of tea, okay? And the software will run. So while it is running, what is happening? So what happens is that the first, one of the first steps in the process is what is known as a pairwise comparison. So what is a pairwise comparison? In which let's say you have five sequences on your FASTA file. There is a pairwise comparison of one to two, one to three, one to four, two to three, two to four, and so on and so forth. And depending upon various philosophies of counting the similarities and differences, a score is generated in a matrix, okay? So there are some rules about this pairwise comparison, which involves global and local alignments. So in a, uh, these alignments, what first happens is regions which are identical, are sort of clamped down in local alignments. As you can see here, glycine, uh, lysine, glycine is clamped down to the same sequence and two sequences being compared. And the rest of the sequences are sort of, you know, aligned to get a more global alignment. So based upon pairwise comparisons, as I mentioned, a, a score is generated in the form of a matrix, okay? And that is used to align sequences. So, just like in an exam where you get marks, okay, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to compare how uh, students are performing, uh, okay, maybe that's not such a good analogy, uh, okay? So you can, or let's talk about soccer, okay? So that is a good analogy where different scores are given depending upon similarity between two pairwise sequences being considered. So, uh, if the sequences are not very similar, okay, there is a penalty that is given and a lower score is given. If two sequences are found to be very similar, a higher score is given, okay? So let's have a look at what that actually means. Let's say there are two sequences in this example, GAT, CTA, these are nucleotides, and there is another sequence which is GAT, CA, okay? So if you're trying to align these two sequences, you put them on two uh, edges uh, of a matrix maybe where you have a GAT CTA and a GAT CA. So if you align the G underneath the G, 
okay? You get a perfect match and you get a score of one. Then if you move to the second position, which is uh, A, you have GA aligning with GA. Hey, perfect match at the previous position. So you reward yourself, okay? You reward yourself and you get a score of two. Then you go to the third position, which is a T. So you have a GAT and a GAT and you get a score of three. Why three? Because the previous two positions are in perfect alignment. Then you go to the fourth position, which is a C. So GATC, GATC, aligning each with each other perfectly. And you're rewarding yourself and you're saying, hey, this is a really good alignment. And you're getting a score of four. Then when you come to the fifth position, which is a T, there is no T in the second sequence. However, the next position is an A, okay? So if you introduce a gap, a deletion or a gap, okay? Then your subsequent nucleotide, which is an A, would align perfectly with A, okay? And you would get a good score because GATC is aligned with GATC. However, since you have introduced a gap, okay, you are going to have to pay a penalty and you're going to subtract one. So even though it's the sixth position, you're getting a score of five, okay, because the first, the previous four positions, okay, are aligned, barring the gap. Now, the difference in some ways, if you want to look at it that way, between maximum parsimony, maximum likelihood, and distance is the penalty that you pay for these alignments, okay? So in the case of maximum parsimony, you know, parsimony, parsimonious, harus, okay? You are penalized the most, okay? So maximum parsimony works with a FASTA file where the sequences are very similar to each other, okay? And there are very few changes, okay? Or variations, if you like, okay? Distance sort of penalizes you in the middle range, okay? Whereas if you have a FASTA file comprised of sequences which are very different from each other or substantially different from each other, you give yourself some latitude, okay? So the penalty that you pay for introducing a gap is the least, okay? So based upon whether you're using maximum parsimony, distance, or maximum likelihood, you're going to generate scores in pairwise alignments, and you're going to use that score to make a tree, okay? We botany people love trees. I think others do also, okay? My the bad, okay? So you're going to generate a tree, okay? You're going to align gene and protein sequences, and you're going to make a tree. So these trees, for example, can be based on matrices of scores, okay? Like based upon percentage of amino acid substitutions and so on and so forth. So here you see an example where you have organism A, B, and C, and a tree which might explain how these sequences arose. So again, I want to point out that this is molecular evolution and not the evolution of the organism, okay? It is the evolution of members of the same gene family. So here you can see that uh, A and C are more similar to each other, okay? Uh, in terms of the second position, uh, whereas the, uh, uh, if a mutation from an ancestral sequence converted a L to a R, by the way, what is L? What amino acid is L? Any student? You can check. It's a leucine. Okay. What amino acid is a W? What amino acid is a Y? Tyrosine, okay? So if there's an ancestral sequence, then what are the steps by which the sequences in the descendant organisms have arisen, okay? So here you can see A and B are on the same branch of a tree because they both have R and R, okay? Shown there in the orange, which is arginine. Okay, and a mutation which converted arginine into a leucine, okay, which separates A, B from C, which is on a separate branch. Okay, however, you can see from this example also that there are multiple possibilities for making a tree. Okay, 
So the most likely possibility, probability, okay, is the one that gives you the best tree to explain a particular data set. Okay, so what is the significance of these sequence alignments? When you are dealing with a pasta file that has different members of a gene family. So you have an ancestral sequence and different mutational steps, which may give rise to sequence A and sequence B. Okay, so these steps can be mutations, which arise from uh, uh, ancestral species zero, by the process of gene duplication, which gives rise to multiple copies of the same gene. So members of a gene family, which are found in the same organism are known as paralogs. Members of the same gene family, which are found in many species, okay, are known as orthologs. And all members of a gene family that arise by common descent, both paralogs and orthologs are known as homologs. So you can study the relationships between paralogs, orthologs, and how they might have arisen, okay, by drawing such phylogenetic trees. Okay, so this is a slide which shows you how multiple sequence alignments are done, MSAs are done, and how you can recreate the steps, the mutational steps maybe, that gave rise to different members of a gene family, both and homologs. Okay, so uh, this is a foundation step in the determination of evolutionary relationships among multiple sequences. And as I had mentioned, you can look at both proteins and nucleotides. So uh, there are various softwares which can convert the MSA data into a tree using various algorithms. And if you have a monophyletic origin or a single ancestral sequence, then you get a rooted tree. If you don't do that, you can still get what is called an unrooted tree or a radial tree. Okay. So you've had your chai and you've come back, okay? Uh, and your software uh, gives you a result with the members of the actin gene family in Arabidopsis, okay? This is known as a multiple sequence alignment. And here you see a multiple sequence alignment or MSA of the actin family in Arabidopsis, the, the functional genes. You can see that all the positions which are highly conserved are marked with a star, okay? Where across a column, you see that they are identical, okay? So they are shown by a star in this MSA. If they are similar to each other and have similar properties, uh, probably denoting synonymous mutations, okay? You see a double star. I'm not going to ask you what is a synonymous mutation, okay? So if they are sort of similar to each other, okay, but they are not identical or very similar to each other in their properties, you see a single dot. If the mutations at a particular position, okay, along this multiple sequence alignment comprises of very different mutations, okay, which are not synonymous, you don't see anything. Okay, so as you can see, the actin gene family members in Arabidopsis are mostly similar to each other, and they have many amino acid residues along uh, the amino acid uh, sequence positions, which are highly conserved, okay. So uh, if you look at a tree of the multiple sequence alignment that we just looked at, which will be generated by your software, you can see that there are two major clusters, one which comprises of ACT9, ACT5, ACT8, ACT2, and another which comprises of others. So what is it that multiple sequence alignments actually show? They actually show similarities in protein structure. So those regions of the amino acid sequences or the MSA that are highly conserved and belong to an alpha helix will remain an alpha helix in all the orthologs or homologs that you're looking at, okay? So there is a ramification in terms of mutations or differences which may or may not be reflected in the protein structure. So if you come back to NCBI, now you know that we are talking about Arabidopsis, we're talking about members of the actin gene family, and we are based upon the work of the pioneer Bob Meagers group, okay, uh, from University of Arizona initially, uh, where we have been looking at the members of the actin gene family. So we've been looking at nucleotides, okay. But with NCBI, uh, you can look at much more. You can look at conserved domains, okay, which characterize members of a particular gene family. You can look at structures like you saw in the previous slide, 
okay? And you can use CN3D and such softwares to look at the actual structures and see if they're similar, they're dissimilar, and so on and so forth, okay? You can add information uh, to the FASTA file, and the information that you are beginning to understand, you're getting to know the members of a gene family really well, really closely. Okay, so you can use something like the genome data viewer because there are multiple genomes annotated, fully annotated, uh, freely available, uh, full genome information in the database. So if you type uh, actin and arabidopsis, uh, you can uh, look at the genome data uh, pertaining to the actin gene family in arabidopsis much more closely. So you can see from the little inset here, I hope you can see it, where you get the same kind of information uh, about various members of the gene family, and you can click on these contexts, which constitute the full genome reference data sequence in the database, okay? So you can use various tools in NCBI to understand the uh, structure of these members of the actin gene family in Arabidopsis. Do they all have the same number of exons? Do they all have the same number of introns? Do they occur in the same position? Okay, and so on and so forth. Okay, you can see the size of the exons, the size of the introns, and you can see on the left bottom corner of the slide, you can see what is called all the hits, the ontological hits of, let's say, Act 7 in Arabidopsis thaliana in the chromosomes, okay? The various chromosomes of Arabidopsis. So there are five chromosomes, Act 7, as you can see in this box, okay, is on the fifth chromosome, okay? These particular tools enables you to actually look at the real sequence of the Act 7 gene uh, of uh, Arabidopsis. Okay, you can also use uh, the GDV to get more information about the various members of the actin gene family. So if you click, just click on one of the exons, you can get this particular pop-up box, which will give you information on say ACT12, where it says members of the actin subclass, uh, RNA is expressed at very low levels in vegetative organs. It tells you where it is expressed, and it actually refers to the work of Bob Meager and his group who used Gus fusion reported gene constructs to find out where in the plant tissue during development actin genes, members of different actin genes are functional. Okay, so this is a, a follow up from Map Viewer, which is also available in NCBI, where you can get. Uh, various regions of the chromosomes that are associated with actin genes of Arabidopsis. And if you click on one of these red uh, zones, you can actually get a very fine map view, okay, uh, of these uh, actin gene families and also link out. In other words, you can link out to other databases which provide more information about the Arabidopsis genome, especially TER, which is the Arabidopsis information resource. So if you look at this database, it will give you information like expressed in mature pollen. Okay, so it will give you actual transcriptional data, simple, where it is expressed. So now your FASTA file can become more rich. So you know where various members of the actin gene family are expressed. So now the tree that you're looking at has a different meaning, okay? You see that the cluster made up of nine, five, eight, and two are expressed in vegetative tissues, whereas the others are expressed in reproductive tissues. This particular observation is what is published in a classical, very highly cited paper by Bob Meager's group about the structure and evolution of the actin gene family in Arabidopsis. And you can now understand how these various figures uh, and data in these classical papers have come about. You can see a multiple sequence alignment. You can see a matrix of scores. You can see a t tree, okay? But most importantly, it helps you understand a hypothesis that was proposed in the 1990s about the evolution of the uh, genes that are involved in the function of the plant cytoskeleton. So this, the statement of the hypothesis, which is there in the textbooks, now 
in 2021 as a theory, okay, and a given, is that the macro evolution of vegetative and reproductive plant structures. So if you think about, I don't know, mosses, okay, you think about a gymnosperm, you think about an angiosperm, and you think about the complexity and differences of vegetative and reproductive plant structures, you appreciate that it is linked to the molecular evolution of two differentially regulated classes. Actually, now we know they are subclasses of cytoskeletal genes that physically direct development or are involved in development. Okay. So um, if you're a teacher, if you're a student and you want to explore this further, you can uh, go to resources, you can stay with NCBI, and you can learn more about these genes, okay, by uh, looking at some of the links that are attached. For example, uh, in the introduction, we were hearing about the uh, interdisciplinary approach, uh, you know, to understanding uh, doing these workshops. You realize that this kind of a bifurcation of different members of the actin uh, gene family in plants is actually something that's also common in animals, in humans, in fact. Okay, so you can actually look, okay, at if you see something similar like this, do you see two different classes in, say, human, chimpanzee, rhesus monkey, dog, cow, mouse, rat, chicken, zebrafish, fruit fly, rice, and frog? So I'm just reading this about homologues of the actin 12 gene. Uh, which is available uh, in NCBI. So you can explore, make your own questions, teach, learn, okay, and face a new, brave new world, okay. So these are some of the uh, books that I had talked to you about. Uh, the first uh, reference is, uh, is the paper that I was talking about, then the Higgins and Taylor book, which you can buy for 295 rupees. Uh, you know, that's also a great book. So, uh, of course, you should and you can certainly surf the, the web, okay? So um, with this particular uh, introduction and first part of looking at how bioinformatics can be used to study uh, gene products that are involved in uh, the plant cytoskeleton, I hope you have a feeler for what all is possible uh, with this particular area. And now I will ask uh, my students to take over and I will stop sharing. Okay, so uh, the other thing I did want to mention is that a lot of these uh, softwares, a lot of these uh, uh, ways of doing these experiments, uh, uh, you know, can be done with, uh, uh, can be done on your smartphone. Okay, you don't really need a computer. You can also uh, look at that. So uh, I will ask uh, Ashima. Uh, Ashima is from an undergrad from Hindu college. And uh, she's going to start uh, with uh, the second part of our class. Just a minute, Professor Sudeshna. Would Hello. You, like, uh, you would like to answer the questions now or later I, on at the end? I think we'll answer it at the end. Oh, excellent. <laughs> Young people, you answered all the names of the various amino acids. and Awesome. I'll just have a look. I'll just have a look. I was so we'll worried like because today. cell biology also I'm taking. So I thought they haven't given answer, but there are answers. No, no, they the have. Chat. Yes, I will just check. I will just check. And uh, I'm going to, questions yes. we will take uh, at the end. Questions? At the end. Yes, please. Okay. Yes, please. All right. All right, Ashima, all yours. Um, hello, a very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, please okay. go on. So it's a pleasure to be a part of the workshop in KMC College. And uh, thank you for having us. And uh, so after Ma'am's lecture, uh, I'm Ashima Mehra, and I'm doing my PhD in plant biotic interactions lab on uh, insect-plant interactions in economically important tree legume species. And uh, today I'll be talking about protein sorting and IP sort software. So if you talk about protein, so protein, as we all say from the uh, school days, we know they are the building blocks of life. And uh, 
you all must be aware about the central dogma in eukaryotic cells. So the central dogma actually focuses on DNA, DNA replicates, and it transcribes into HNRNA, which further processes and gives mRNA. So this process is known as transcription. This mRNA, with the help of ribosomes, it translates into proteins. Now, most proteins are first synthesized in the cytosol and carry to specific locations such as mitochondria or chloroplast. So protein sorting is the mechanism by which a cell transports proteins to the appropriate positions in the cell or outside of it. This is extremely valuable for annotating novel proteins. How? Because predictions of localization sites is useful in various ways because cellular functions are often localized in specific compartments. The predictions of localization sites of unknown or unannotated proteins may be used to gain some indications of its function. Interestingly, proteins can move between compartments in different ways. Like uh, you must be aware about the compartmentalization in cellular organelles. In the slide, you can see a eukaryotic cell, a mitochondria, and a chloroplast. So in eukaryotic cell, you know there is the nucleus, it has a nuclear membrane. So there are gated transport that happens. Then there is transmembrane transport in mitochondria and peroxisome, and similarly, vesicular transport in ER. Uh, before starting, we should credit the Nobel Prize laureate who helped us in the field of protein sorting, especially George Pelage for discoveries concerning the structural and functional organization of the cell, along with Günther Global for the discovery that proteins have intrinsic signals that govern their transport and localization in the cell. Moving ahead, protein subcellular localization. Now, what is it? So in most cases, what happens is the information determining the subcellular localization site is represented as a short amino acid sequence segment called a protein sorting signal. So in the cell, what happens is there is a lot of protein trafficking. So signal peptides which are present on these uh, specialized proteins, they act to control and to regulate the protein so that they go to specified organelles. Some signals are easily recognizable, while others they are very difficult to understand, like beta barrels, because they don't have that consensus sequence. Now, proteins must have intrinsic signals for their localization, a cellular address kind of a thing. It's like when you write mails to your uh, friend. In earlier days, we used to write mails and the letters and on the letters, we used to write the address. So the address has to be correct so that the letter reaches to the destined person. Similarly, these sequences, they act like the, that address, the postal code. The pre-sequences of the targeting peptides are often found at the end terminal extension. I'll be elaborating on this in the next slide. It is composed of between 6 to 136 basic and hydrophobic amino acids. And uh, these signal sequences, they are removed from the finished protein by specialized signal peptidases once the sorting process has been completed. So when the roll is over, we just get moved up, a washed up. Now, enough experimental data already exists to build highly accurate computational predictors of localization. Now, moving ahead, there, if we study the common structure of N-terminal signal peptides, so how does it look like? The, this slide shows the general structure of a uh, signal peptide. It is basically composed of three main parts. In the slide, you can see the yellow colored part, that is the foremost part, is the end region, the positive charge domain. It is followed by a hydrophobic region, the blue part that you can see. This is the hydrophobic core forming alpha helix. This is in turn followed by the C region, the cleavage site, forming a beta sheet. The initial part of the protein important to protein secretion is called pro-region and residues before the cleavage site, which is present between the C-region and the pro-region, they are called as C1 and after the cleavage site, they are called as 
P uh, high five uh, one. So cleavage occurs at A X ray or B X ray motif. So this is the common structure for N-terminal signal peptides. For uh, um, uh, for the peptides that are destined for the mitochondria, they have some amino acids that are different from the ones that are destined to the chloroplast. Now, prediction from the known data. Different information, it can be used for predictions from the known data, like the sequence motif, which I have already talked about. There can also be amino acid composition and homology. In sequence motif, the N-terminal, C-terminal, and mid-sequence, they play the key role. The N-terminal is especially important. It is involved in secretory signal peptide, peptides, mitochondrial targeting peptides, and chloroplast transit peptides. Now, to study them in more depth, there is a concept of p sort families. So what is it? What happens is, like, what, like you have NCBI, it is... Uh, uh, you can use it for sequence retrieval and uh, getting faster files like ma'am had talked about. Similarly, there is also a P-sort family server that the link is shown in the slide. It contains several variant tools for the prediction of protein localization sites and cells. Because what will happen if the protein localization sites, they are, if the protein doesn't go to the respective sites, then what will happen? there will be no synthesis of the uh, respective protein and the downstream processes, and thus there will be diseases. So to avoid that, there should be proper uh, protein sorting should occur. It, uh, this P sort, when the prediction of protein localization sites and cells is achieved, then it receives the information of an amino acid sequence and its source origin. Example, any like gram negative bacteria as input. Then what happens is, then it analyzes the input sequence by applying the stored rules for various sequence features of known protein sorting signals. And finally, it reports the possibility for the input protein to be localized at each candidate site with additional information. I've already talked about the variant tools of the P-sort family. So, in p sort family, there the first that the foremost that uh, was constructed was p sort an old version for plants and bacteria. So, uh, this was followed by p sort 2 which is recommended for yeast and animals. Then ip sort came into picture. It is specifically for N-terminal sorting signals for plants or non-plants. Remember, I've already told you about the N-terminal sorting signal and its importance in the previous slides. This was further modified into p sort b This is mostly recommended for gram-negative bacteria. So if you want to look at the bacterial uh, sequence information, the protein or amino acid sequence uh, information, you can visit p sort b Then it is uh, the recent most is the Wolf p sort and it is recommended for animal, plant, and fungi. But for the current uh, uh, study, we'll be looking at ip sort so the overview of IP sort is it is a subcellular localization site predictor for N-terminal sorting signals. So given the protein sequence, it will predict whether it contains a signal peptide or a mitochondrial targeting peptide that is MTV, MTP, or chloroplast transit peptide that is CTP. So if on uh, Google, I'll just show you briefly how to get started uh, with the IP sort. Just on Google, you can type IP sort in bioinformatics, and then you'll find this homepage that pops up. You can click on this homepage, and then you'll be directed to the server. Welcome to the IP sort www service uh, section. This uh, is a screenshot of the p sort server that you may also find on Google. This was earlier used, but nowadays we generally use IP sort. The basic structure of how the sequence information is processed in IP sort is summarized in this slide. So please pay attention for two seconds because uh, because uh, subsequent uh, lab members of my lab will be dealing about the examples uh, pertaining to these um, um, terminology. So 
IP sort structure, this structure of IP sort is simply a decision list consisting of three nodes and two for non plant. So you can see the first node, what happens is at the first node, so when you, you uh, give input data to it in the form of FASTA files, then what happens? This software at the first node, the protein sequence is checked if it is a signal peptide or not. If it is predicted as ST, then the output is simply ST. So no worries. But if it is not predicted as ST, then at the second node, the protein sequence is judged if it is either a mitochondrial targeting peptide or a chloroplast transit peptide. If it is determined not to be either of them, then what happens? The sequence is predicted to be other. For non-plant sequences, this will be the final node. So at the last node, so there are basically three nodes, one, two, and three. So at the last node, what happens? The protein sequence is judged if it is a mitochondrial targeting peptide or not. If yes, then MTP, that is a mitochondrial targeting peptide, is the output. And if no, then it is a chloroplast tra transit peptide. The foremost thing that you should remember is the rules deciding whether or not the given signal contain a certain signal consists of two elements. These uh, elements will be further elaborated uh, in the subsequent slides. So the first one is an amino acid index rule, and the second is alphabet indexing plus pattern rule, except for signal peptides with only an amino acid index rule. To be judged, yes, at each node out of these one, two, three, and the input amino acid sequence that you may uh, take uh, from NCBI in terms of FASTA file, amino acid FASTA file. So this must satisfy both of these two rules. This is not applicable for the signal peptides. So these are the uh, suggested readings. So if any one of you is interested, you may like to read more about IP sort and uh, you want to ex like to explore more about it, please have a look. Uh, especially the Benai paper of 2002 is very useful. So please do visit. So thank you. Now, uh, another lab member from my lab, uh, Ms. Singh Nive, will continue the further presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, hello. Um, hello, good evening. I'm Tingneva Mate. Today I will be talking about localization side of protein sequences using IP sort, right from sequence retrieval to FASTA file preparation and then the localization. For sequence retrieval, today we will be using the NCBI database. And you can retrieve <clears throat> your sequences by uh, ontological search <clears throat> or using the sequences. For ontological uh, search, you can use your gene name, your species name, or accession number. Accession numbers are unique identifier for sequence record in the database. In this case, uh, you have to first go to the NCBI website, which is given the first inset, and then you will be taken to the NCBI homepage which is shown in the second inset. And here you will type in your gene name, species name, or your accession number. Uh, this is the search engine. And uh, for this exercise, we have used the accession number. And once you have typed in, you can click on the search button. And in the next, you can retrieve similar sequences if, if you have a nucleotide or a protein sequence using the BLAST tool, which is in the NCBI itself. So in this third inset, in the BLAST window, there is options for nucleotide BLAST or protein BLAST, depending on your sequences, you can either choose, uh, you can choose either of them. And once you click on the button, you will be taken to the BLAST window where you can um, enter your sequence, sequence or your accession number in this box and then hit on the BLAST button. Now, preparation of FASTA files. FASTA files, they are text-based format of uh, your nucleotide sequences or amino acid sequences. So uh, once you have searched your desired gene or your species, you will be taken to the GenBank flat file, which is shown in the first inset. Here you will have information, all the information about your sequences. For this exercise, we have uh, taken the Rubisco protein from Cucumis sativus. Then 
on the top, you will see the FASTA option where you, if you click on it, you will be taken to a window which will have the sequences, which is within the red box. So this is your FASTA sequence. You can copy and paste it. So uh, when you name your um, FASTA sequences, you should always put the greater than symbol and your name, name of your choice. For this, we have uh, put the accession number and followed by the sequence. And in case of this exercise, we have used the amino acid sequence. Then you should, uh, for the localization side of protein sequences using IP sort, uh, the sequences retrieved uh, earlier, they are being used here. For protein sorting signals, as discussed earlier, the N-terminal sorting proteins like the signal peptides, the chloroplast transit peptides, the mitochondrial targeting peptides, they are being used. Signal peptide, they have conserved three region structure, a positively charged N region, a hydrophobic H region, and a polar C region. The chloroplast transit peptides are known to be rare in acidic residues, and the mitochondrial targeting peptides are rich in arginine, alanine, and serine, while negatively charged amino acid residues like aspartic acid and glutamic acid, they are rare. So once uh, you type in the IP sort website on your browser, website address on your browser, you'll be taken to the main website, which has been shown in the earlier slides. And then you will go to the IP sort prediction where uh, the gray area is where you will have to paste in your sequences. And you will specify if it is a plant protein or an unplanned protein. Then you will hit on the submit button. For further reading, uh, the Banai et al., which has been published in Journal Bioinformatics uh, in 2002, is being suggested. So once you hit the submit button, you will get a result uh, window, which is similar to this, which is presented in this slide. So uh, for this particular exercise, we have taken the Rubisco protein from Cucumis sativus. And uh, since it is a plant protein, the three nodes are being considered, which is the signal peptide, the mitochondrial or chloroplast peptide, and the third node, which is the mitochondrial. And um, for the signal peptide, average hydropathy plot was done. For the second node, the average negative charge plot was done. And the mitochondrial node, the average isoelectric point was done. And the judgment of the um, software is that the signal peptide is no and yes for the second node and no for the third node as well. Um, sorry. Uh, so the IP sort, it predicted the protein as having a chloroplast transit peptide. In this slide, we can see that the average negative charge plot, uh, the threshold is 0 0.083, while the value of a sequence is zero. So the higher the negative charge, the more the protein has acidic residue. But in our case, since uh, the value of a sequence is lower than the threshold, it has no acidic residue, which corresponds to the statement that the CTP has rare acidic residue. In the next exercise, we took aquaporin protein from bacteria bacillus. Since it is a non-plant, it considered only two nodes the signal peptide and the mitochondrial peptide. And it judged yes for signal peptide. And the IP sort, it predicted the protein as having a signal peptide. And uh, in this case, the average hydropathy index plot, the threshold is 0 0.953, while the value of a sequence is 1.96667. And the more hydrophobic the protein is, the more is the average hydropathy index. And since our sequence uh, crossed the threshold and is much higher than the threshold, it is considered to be hydrophobic and which uh, corresponds to the statement that the signal peptide has a conserved hydrophobic uh, H term. And uh, this is how localization side of protein sequences is done in IP sort. And in the subsequent slide, my uh, colleague will present about the amino acid indexing. Hi, Mansi. Hello, ma'am. Hello, everyone. A very good afternoon. 
Uh, I am Mansi, and I am going to talk about amino acid index analysis using IPSort web service. Before starting with the uh, software per se, I would like to uh, brush up on amino acid and its and their properties. So we know that genetic code encodes for twenty basic amino acids, and these amino acids are the building blocks for all the plant and animal proteins that, that we study about. So the properties of amino acids determine the protein structure. We know that the primary structure of protein is determined by the amino acid composition of the protein, the spatial arrangement of close and nearby amino acid sequences in the three-dimensional space determines the secondary structure of every protein, and likewise the distant amino acid sequences in the three-dimensional space determine the tertiary structure of the protein. So the constituent amino acid has uh, acids have multifaceted properties, and they are responsible for the specificity and diversity of the protein structure and functions. Before we start uh, with uh, the stepwise tutorial on how to run an amino acid index analysis, uh, I would like to describe you about uh, the database of amino acid ind indices. So amino acid index is a database of amino acid indices and amino acid mutation matrices. It has two categories, AA index one and AA index two. AA index one is a, index, is a set of uh, numerical values which represent various physical, chemical, and biochemical properties of different amino acids. These properties are like isoelectric points, hydrophobicity, alpha helix propensity, beta sheet propensities, or hydropathy index, which uh, most of you would have re uh, read about in biomolecules or biochemistry lessons. Uh, on the other hand, the AA index 2 deals with the amino acid mutation matrix, which has the numerical values representing the similarity of uh, different amino acids to one another. So the IPSort web server has the uh, tool for amino acid indexing, and it deals with the uh, first one, uh, first amino index, uh, amino acid index uh, database. That is the AA index one. So I will directly uh, take you to the second part of my presentation, where we talk about running the amino acid indexing analysis tool at IPSort uh, web service. For this, the first step is to connect to internet on your device and visit the IPSort web service homepage through your web browser. Once you're there, you can find the run amino acid index analysis option under the contents. And when you click on that, it takes you to the uh, AA index analysis tool. And uh, let me describe this uh, window to you first. So uh, the screenshot is of the amino acid index analysis tool of IPSort web server. And here you can see a list of uh, rather a very long list of amino acid indices, which you can select from and uh, pick for your analysis or whatever your interest area is. And then uh, below that is a GUI import box where you can enter or paste the query sequence, query protein sequence, which you uh, might have uh, like retrieved from different databases. Then below that is a GUI input box to customize the window size for the analysis of your query protein sequence. And there is also a provision to customize or specify a part of query sequence for analysis. And then at the bottom is the submit button, which can help you to make all the magic happen. So the next step is to choose amino acid index, which you want to uh, analyze your protein sequence for. And once you have done that, uh, it highlights the selected choice in blue color. After that, you paste your sequence, uh, which you have, my, uh, which you can retrieve from NCBI, like you were told in the previous tutorial. So the query protein sequence is pasted in the GUI box provided. You can also, uh, customize your search for window size or the part of protein you want to search, analyze. And if you don't state that, then the default window size of 10 is selected by the program and the entire sequence is analyzed. So then you uh, click on the submit button. Once that is done, uh, then the software generates outputs for you. 
and i have worked out some examples for you so that uh, you can analyze and get a feel of what outputs from uh, amino acid index analysis look like here i have selected the normalized frequency of alpha helix as my choice of amino acid index and i have pasted the uh, protein sequence which uh, was shown to uh, like which was retrieved in the previous tutorial for rubisco uh, in cucumis sativus in the first example i have kept the parameters as default and not specified anything so once we sub, uh, click on submit we get this uh, screen as the output as you can see that the, on the top of the graph the amino acid index which i selected is stated and on the y axis of the plot uh, it shows the default window size which was selected and uh, it so we have the overall frequency calculated for each amino acid to occur in alpha helix for our protein query sequence and the output graph shows the plot of average values of normalized alpha helix frequency for different amino acids which were in the selected window size in example 2 i have selected uh, isoelectric point as my choice of amino acid index and the sequence is essentially the same as previous one here i have customized the window size to 15 and uh, when we click submit we get this output it is uh, more or less similar to the previous one you can see the selected amino acid index on top and the average with uh, window size on the y axis of the graph and uh, so as most of you would be knowing the isoelectric point of a amino acid is the ph point at which the amino acid has no electrical charge so this graph act, uh, essentially shows the output plot of average values of isoelectric points for amino acids in the selected window size so just like i have done for two uh, amino acid indices you can try out this tool for as many as amino acid indices you like and you can also play around with different uh, protein sequences or amino acid sequences which you have learned to retrieve from uh, ncbi databases in the previous slides and if you want to explore this database further i would suggest that you scroll down the ip sort web home page and below the references you can find a link uh, to amino acid index database and this link takes you to the actual home page of amino acid index databases on genome net server and you can find a lot more about this database uh, on there you can talk uh, you can find out information about the current releases of this database previous releases what are the differences in different uh, versions of this database if you are into uh, algorithms and matrices you can also find out a lot of stuff there and uh, the main home page also talks about different retrieval systems to get more uh, uh, like get different forms of uh, amino acid index data from this database and uh, if you're not familiar with the amino acid indices that i have talked about you can also find a list of amino acid indices Uh, which were included in this uh, database at the current version and they also have mentioned several references for each amino acid in this uh, index so you can read more about it from there and apart from that i have listed the citations within so you can read and explore this tool as much as you like now my uh, lab uh, now parul ji will explain about the new tools about two algorithms that uh, are used to make the software so uh, one of the software has already been introduced uh, ip sort hello am i audible yes yes you are audible um uh, yeah thank you so i'll be talking about another software called uh, predici which is uh, based on a slightly different uh, algorithm 
so it is based on a position weight matrix approach now what is this position weight matrix if you look at the picture below a here shows a uh, 10 dna sequences now if you look at the first position of uh, these sequences we can see that uh, five of these positions are occupied by c so the probability of having c at the first position in these 10 sequences is 5 upon 10 so 0.5 so we get a, a position probability matrix like that for each position and all the sequences now this position probability matrix is then converted into a position weight matrix by converting these probabilities into likelihood scores i will not go into the details of that maybe you will learn it in the higher classes i'll talk about the software more now how is it different it uh, allows the evaluation of whole proteome data sets so analysis of large data sets in real time with high accuracy it is freely available and the interface is user friendly also the results are user as well as computer friendly it is also freely available as a java package and can be integrated into other software projects so how does it work first you have to visit the software by entering the web address and uh, like ip sort you have to put in the fasta you can paste the sequence in fasta format or you can upload a fasta file change the parameters according to your uh, requirement and hit the submit button now as soon as you submit you can get the result whether or not a signal peptide is present in the sequence or not you can click the details tab to get a detailed result output the interpretation of these results is quite similar to ip sort and has already been discussed by ting so moving further uh, you can also get a list of references that you can look uh, to understand more about how the software is uh, made so uh, coming to the algorithms for prediction software so far we have learned that uh, signal peptides serve as address tags and uh, since we live in the post omics era it is highly desirable to develop fast and accurate algorithms so that uh, the signal sequences can be identified and uh, their cleavage sites can be predicted now based on different kinds of characteristics several algorithms such as neural networks and hidden markov models have been used the latest model that is being used is the bayesian network which is a method of statistic inference in which some kind of evidence or uh, prior observation is used to calculate the probability if a hypothesis may be true so i'll be discussing hidden markov model and the bayes theorem using a real life example so if we look at the life of a science student you know on a daily basis we tend to do some experiments some of them work some of them fail now uh, it respective of whether my experiment worked or it failed uh, in the evening i go out to my favorite cafe with my best friend to vent out and to have my evening snack and beverage so when my experiment works i treat myself with a tall glass of oreo shake and when it doesn't work i order a black coffee uh, because i have to pull an all nighter to troubleshoot my experiment so my friend has no idea whether my experiment has worked or failed but on the basis of my order she infers whether my experiment has worked or failed so experiment worked oreo shake experiment failed black coffee so far so good but there are exceptions sometimes even though my experiment failed i need a sugar rush and i order an oreo shake with a probability of 40% so the probability is 0.4 in that case similarly sometimes when my experiment worked i still order a cup of black coffee with a probability of 20% and uh, the probability of ordering an oreo shake in that case will be 80% or 0.8 now the fact you know when things work they work for a long time so when experiments are working they are working for several days together so if experiment worked one day the probability of it working the next day can be called uh, can be said say 
and so the, it for it to fail the next day will be point 2 and similarly for it to fail uh, one day and on the second day it is point 6 and for it to it works the next day will be point 4 so the fact that my experiment worked or failed is hidden from my friend and what she sees are only observations these values the hidden values are the transition probabilities this is a white transition because we are transitioning from one hidden state to another and the observation the probability of the observations that are there are called the emission probabilities which are emitting from the transition probabilities now what is the probability of my experiment working or failing on a random day okay one day i decided i will not order any beverage so how will my friend work find out whether my experiment worked or failed now we know from the transition probability that the uh, chance or the probability of my experiment to work is 0.8 the consecutive day and for it to fail one day and work the other day the probability is 0.4 so we come up with an equation that the overall probability of my experiment to work will be 0.8 times uh the probability of it to work plus 0.4 times for it to fail similarly we get another question uh, equation the probability for it to fail will be 0.2 times the probability for, for probability for it to work plus 0.6 times uh probable into the probability for it to fail now these two questions are actually very similar to each other and we also know that the experiment can either work or fail so the total will have to be one so we get the third equation which is probability the sum of the probabilities will be one so if you uh, solve for the two probabilities you'll get that the probability for an experiment to work is 2/3 and for it to fail is 1/3 so now we know that on a random day these are the probabilities for my experiments to work and fail but i put a condition now that i ordered oreo shake okay so my in my friend's head it's like oh it is more likely that my experiment has worked but how is she going to know that okay the probabilities that we calculated earlier 2/3 and 1/3 these are the prior probabilities okay now we know that for the experiment to work it happens 2 out of 3 times and it fails 1 out of 3 times and we also know from the emission probabilities suppose five uh, i worked for like five days and my experiment worked for five days out of those five days 80% of the times i ordered oreo shake that means four out of five times similarly on the second day that my experiment worked i mean five days that my experiment worked i again ordered four out of five times i ordered oreo shake now five days when my experiment failed the probability of me ordering oreo shakes was 40% so i, I ordered two out of uh, two days out of those five days i ordered oreo shake and three days out of those five days i ordered coffee so what is the base theorem let's say if i ordered oreo shake which is the condition in this case given that i ordered oreo shake the probability of my experiment to work is going to be 8 by 10 now how did we get that total number of times that i ordered oreo shake forget coffee only oreo shake is 4 plus 4 8 plus 2 10 and when did it work these two times so it's going to be 4 plus 4 8 now again given that i ordered oreo shake what is the probability that my experiment failed so it's going to be 2 upon the total number which is 10 similarly if i ordered coffee what is the probability that my experiment worked it is going to be 2 1 2 1 2 3 2 plus 3 5 so 2 upon 5 and for it to fail it's going to be 3 upon 5 so these probabilities that we get are now posterior probabilities or conditional probability that we have found so these uh, models are or base theorem these are very popular in machine learning programs so we train our uh, softwares the protein prediction softwares with large data set that is known and uh, we use these algorithms 
to predict these sequences by, with high accuracy. So if some of you are feeling too adventurous, you can work out this problem. This is a homework exercise. So if for two consecutive days, I ordered Oreo shake. What do you think was the status of my experiment? I will give you a hint. Now, the, there are four possibilities. There are there are two days. So the number of possibilities are going to be two to the power n, which is four. That means both the days my experiment worked or it failed both the days or, or first day worked, second day failed or first day failed, second day worked. Now you calculate the overall probability for each of these events and the one that has maximum probability or maximum likelihood of occurring will be the right answer. So that's about it. On behalf of my lab mates, I would like to thank uh, DBT, Delhi University and Kirodimal College to give us an opportunity like this. And last but not the least, students of Botany Honours and everyone else who has joined. I hope you get a chance soon to experience the joy of experiments working and maybe order a large audio shake. Thank you. Thank you, Parul. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, pitching in and helping out. Uh, I hope that.